Hello everyone, this is QTV News. I am Maria Massani and thanks for joining us. First, the main local, international and sports news headlines. Americans go to the polls in one of the most hotly contested and seemingly divisive presidential elections in its history. We bring you an exclusive interview with America's ambassador to the Gambia. Dozens of nurses today gathered at the Ministry of Health in Banjul to voice their dissatisfaction after working for months without pay. A Gambian base in Nigeria has been appointed acting senior director of the African Development Bank Group's Nigeria country office. Residents in Pirai Tenda village in the Upper River region have raised health concerns over their only source of water. In international news, the French government on Monday said more than 50 terrorists linked to Al-Qaeda group were killed in Mali last week during an operation by French forces. In sports, the president of the Gambian Volleyball Federation, Baidu Rujalo, has been elected on post as president of the Confederation of African Volleyball Zone 2. First, a message on the passing of Lamin R. Dabo, the deputy governor of Central River Region. His Excellency President Adam Obara has expressed his sincere and heartfelt condolences to Aja Maimuna Sisa Dabo and the entire Dabo family of Pirang. Following the death of Lamin R. Dabo, the deputy governor of the Central River Region, according to a press release from State House, President Barrow remarked, It is a sad day for me. Upon receiving the sad news, the death of Lamin R. Dabo, as he is fondly called by his close associates, is a great loss to his family as well as the entire nation. He will be remembered for his political engagement to advance democracy in the country. He worked hard in serving humanity to leave a legacy in his community and the nation. In recent years, he took up an administrative role as deputy governor to nurture the democratic change and support the reform processes. We join the president in praying that Allah will bless the soul of Lamin R. Dabo with mercy and receive him in genital furdaus. Now the local news in detail. Stay with us. Americans go to the polls in one of the most hotly contested and seemingly divisive presidential elections in its history. The polls put Democrat challenger Biden ahead, but the electoral outcome is by no means certain and many predict a disorderly path to the White House. Mumudum Boj, who spoke exclusively to the America's ambassador to the Gambia, tells us more. By Tuesday morning, according to the U.S. Elections Project, nearly 100 million ballots had already been submitted through in-person early voting and by mail, more than two-thirds of votes cast in the entire 2016 election, and tens of millions of votes remain up for grabs before polls close in the early hours of Wednesday. Many expect a record turnout, with predictions expecting it to be the largest for a century. But is the U.S. election a make or break for America, as some analysts have suggested, arguing that the election of Donald Trump, as well as being a terrible news for the majority of Americans, would have a damning impact on the future of addressing the climate crisis, global health, diplomacy, and more? In an exclusive QTV interview with the American ambassador, I put the question to him. I can overstate it. I think I do think that Americans are particularly energized around the the various issues that are being debated in the public public sphere uh, right now, and that's that's really creating a tremendous amount of uh, of interest in this election. Far more interest by, from the average American probably than in the past. And so, I do think that uh, both sides uh, clearly think that uh, both major candidates for pres the presidency. And I just want to emphasize that election day that it's not just the presidential election. Today, we also, um, every two years, the entire House of Representatives uh, runs for election. Uh, we, every seat, all 435 seats in the House are up for election. For the ambassador, it's far from make or break, but standing in notable contrast to this benign assessment of the U.S. political landscape is Joe Biden's tweeted alarm. Quote, if we give Donald Trump another four years in the White House, he will forever alter the character of our nation. We can't let that happen. Ordinarily, this might be dismissed as words of political opportunism and the words of an opponent attempting to unseat an incumbent. However, the reality of a fractured nation, brought violently home in what has been described as America's summer of racial discontent, is inescapable. As many analysts have observed, whoever wins the election will inherit a deeply polarized society, a democracy under immense strain, and the weakened global standing of the United States. 
But what difference would a Biden or Trump win make in America's relation to Africa and the Gambia specifically? What, what do you make of that? Well, all I can say is, you know, this was uh, it was uh, the elections that took place here in 2016 and then the inauguration in 2017 of His Excellency President Barrow uh, and uh, uh, the, the policy of the United States government in terms of support for uh, the Gambian government's efforts uh, to to shine a light on some of the events that took place either through the commission, um, the Jana Commission effort or uh, the TRC. Uh, the United States government support for those processes and also our engagement with civil society um, um, in a variety of areas, uh, including uh, providing some capacity building support to the National Assembly uh, to better enable the National Assembly to fully exercise their rights under the 1997 Gambian Constitution to provide a, a real balance to the executive. Uh, those are all actions and support that was provided during the Trump administration. So, Many studies have consistently claimed that democratic presidents tend to be more responsive to African aspirations and interests. But that claim is oversold, according to a recent paper by two researchers at the University of Witzwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Since the end of the Reagan administration, the subsequent Republican administrations under George H.W. Bush, who was president between 1989 and 1993, and George W. Bush, who was president between 2001 and 2009, matched and in some cases outperformed the Democratic administrations of Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. The initial humanitarian intervention into Somalia in 1990 was under Bush the Elder, whereas the Rwandan genocide occurred under the watch of President Clinton. And many have criticized the Obama administration for deepening the militarization of the U.S.-Africa policy. Democrats also shy away from the fact that the USA effected more deportations under President Obama's than under any previous administrations. For all his anti-immigrant rhetoric, even President Trump has not come close to matching that. The researchers advise that Africa should be wary of fixating on who gets in the White House and instead plan collective positions that can engage the U.S. administration. The Democrats have been buoyed by polls showing Joseph R. Biden Jr. with small but durable leads in battleground states. And as one analyst put it, no president has won the election with an approval rating as low as Trump's average of 44%. But, it is often said, and Hillary Clinton discovered in 2016, national polls might be a good guide as to how popular a candidate is across the country as a whole, but they are not necessarily a good way to predict the result of the election. That is because the U.S. uses an electoral college system, a unique constitutional arrangement many non-Americans struggle to understand. 13 independent states, and that there were concerns that were about states, uh, specific state policy, state interest, state sovereign authority. Uh, and, and in point of fact, the Constitution grants to the individual states in the United States any authorities uh, outside uh, that are not, not delineated within the U.S. Constitution as being a federal uh, authority matter. So uh, the Electoral College is frankly has its... The total of 538 Electoral College votes are up for grabs, so a candidate needs to hit 270 to win. The nation and indeed the world hold their breath not only over who will win, but when the result will be known. And would there be an orderly transfer of power, given Trump's ominous statement that he could not guarantee an orderly transfer if the outcome does not favor him? The National Guard is on standby, ready for deployment. Shops in Washington and other cities have boarded up over fears of unrest. Seasoned election watchers cannot recall an American electoral contest that has so captured world attention. In a year defined by COVID-19, no one dares use the analogy, America sneezes and the world catches a cold. Nonetheless, amid nerve-wracking uncertainties at home and abroad, America decides. For QTV News, I am Mamadou Mbouj. Dozens of nurses today gathered at the Ministry of Health in Banjul to voice their dissatisfaction after working for months without pay. The demonstration has, however, prompted dialogue between the nurses and the Ministry of, of, of Health officials. Mouru Lamin Chua reports. These are young health workers and they are marching to the Ministry of Health to raise a united voice about what they describe as their concern, anguish and pain. 
after working for three months without receiving any pay. These young men and women are a batch of 48 registered nurses whose employment started in August, and they tell me that their move to serve the country was never inspired by self-enrichment, but that they saw it as an honor to sacrifice for the people without expecting any delay in receiving their entitlements as employees. Frontline health workers were paid an allowance from the government's COVID-19 fund, but these are some of those who received none. Although they accept that allowance payments happen prior to their employments, three months down the line is enough to get their share. This gathering led to a more than one hour closed door meeting between senior Minister of Health officials and representatives of the nurses group. It ended with both parties finally finding common ground. The permanent secretary too of the health ministry attributes the problem to a breakdown of communication and a follow up of bureaucratic processes which have now been resolved and that this month the nurses affected by this will receive their salaries from August to date. One of the causes of the delay came from them, but because by the time they put all the documentation together, from their side, also took some time, you know, and the, everything, all the documentation, all the documentation process was completed in October, and it, 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 they were completed at the time that the, the salary inputs were already done, then which means that they cannot be paid in October, they can only be paid in November, because when you put the, all the documentation together, and it's submitted to the account, and at the time that uh, the input has already been sent, they cannot process your 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 salary. You know, then it has to wait for the uh, for the following month, and 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 that is why you know they they're going to be paid in November. Even after they have been promised that their problem will soon be solved, these young nurses are still determined to keep pushing their concerns to the ministry until all are fully realized. We will follow it up until something is done about it because we have really um, risked our lives to staff as frontliners and then up to date we think that we deserve the best. We don't ask for any other thing other than what we deserve. Fighting a disease pandemic and addressing other healthcare needs demand paying meaningful attention to the welfare of not only the sick but also the healthcare givers whose population needs to be scaled up at our hospitals. When health workers lay their tools down due to disaffection over their work, it is the sick who will ultimately suffer. Mahmoud Lamin, Chaik UTV News. A Gambian based in Nigeria, Lamin Baro, has been appointed acting senior director of the African Development Bank Group. Nigeria country office, Amar Pijala, has the rest of that story. Lamin Baro's appointment at the Nigerian country office started on November 1st. Mr. Barrow holds a Master's on Arts in Economy Policy from Boston University in USA and a BSc from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He is also an alumni of Executive Programs in Finance from the Wharton Business School, University of Pennsylvania, USA, and Investment and Risk Analyst from Queen's University, Canada. He joined the African Development Bank in 2000. He is currently Director, Joint Secretariat Support Office for the African Development Bank, African Union, and prior to his career at the bank, Mr. Barrow worked at the Gambia National Investment Board as head of the Project Development Unit, Investment Promotion Division, and Division Manager Export Promotion. He served as Principal Economist from 1991 to 1992, Policy Analyst Unit in the Office of the President, Republic of the Gambia, before joining the Company for Habitat and Housing in Africa, where he held several positions between 1994 to 2000. Commenting on his appointment, Dr. Akiyumi Adesina, president of the African Development Bank, said, Lamin is a seasonal professional with a proven track record in strategic management, country dialogue, portfolio management, negotiations, and building partnerships. He adds that Barrow brings into his new role extensive knowledge and a rich experience in policy analysis, strategy implementation, portfolio management, project finance, project preparation, 
regional integration, as well as public and private partnership. The Nigeria country office is strategic for the bank as it manages a large country portfolio and operations with state governments and the private sector. It is hoped that Lamin's extensive managerial experience and knowledge is in operations and excellent diplomatic skills in government relations at the highest levels will help to deepen the bank's operations and engagements with the government and partners in Nigeria. The bank began effective operations on July 1, 1966, and its major role is to contribute to the economic and social progress of its regional member countries, both individually and collectively. As of 31st December 2018, the African Development Bank's authorized capital is subscribed to by 80 member countries made up of 54 independent African countries referred to as regional members and 26 non-African countries called non-regional members. Reporting for QTV News, I am Omar P. Jallo. We will go for a short commercial break and when we come back the news continues with some more local news stories. To stay tuned. Welcome back. Residents in Pirai Tenda village in the Upper River region have raised health concerns over the only source of water in the village. This story by Fodumane is narrated by Al Haji A. F. Jalo. According to locals, the hand pump built in 1982 frequently breaks down and the water is unhealthy for consumption. As water shortages continue to hit villages, communities in the country, villages in Pirai Tenda in the Tumana constituencies says access to Clean drinking water is a big challenge as they have been using a local hand pump for 38 years. Piraitenda village is 37 kilometers from Basse, 4 kilometers of the main highway and has a population of about 1,200 people. According to the Alcaro of the village, Shenisanwo, the water from the local pump used for both domestic and as animal drinking point is unfit for drinking. Yo kolya bini sado to bake bake bake. Handoma ninte. Bini handoma ni kula karola fukata beyond la karola. Drinking. We have about 2,500 people, and our animals are many too. During the dry season, the hand pump serve as a drinking point for animals. Now it is broken. Our VDC has spent a lot of money to repair the pump. The Village Development Committee's chairperson, Seiko Drame, also explained some of the damages they are facing concerning maintenance, amongst others. I am a member of the Cabinetal Company, and I am a member of Saudi Arabia, and I am a member of the Cabinetal Company, and I am a member of the Cabinetal This is the only pump we are all using and our population has increased. The pump is old and the water is unfit for drinking. Recently, we spent about $17,000 to repair it. We need support. The women leader, Mayang Jambo, says the situation has really affected the women who regularly go out to get water. Since the pump was built by the Saudi Sahel project years ago, it is the only source of water and our population has now increased. We have about 670 women who sometimes wake up at 4 a.m. to get water. The health of our children has been affected too as they often complain of diarrhea. They have only one hand pump to cater for over 1,000 people. After serving the community for almost 40 years, it appears the local hand pump has either reached its lifespan or needs a proper thorough maintenance. Many in the village would appreciate a modern, up-to-date replacement. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alaji F. Jalo. We will take another short break and when we continue with international and sports news when we return.
Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, this is QTV News. In international news, the French government on Monday said that last week, more than 50 terrorists linked to the Al-Qaeda group were killed in Mali during an operation launched by its anti-jihadist force in the region. The jihadists were killed near the borders of central Mali with Burkina Faso and Niger, and over 30 motorcycles were destroyed and French troops confiscated arms, explosives and a suicide vest. The French Defense Minister Florence Parly said she had earlier met Niger President Mohamedou Isufu and her Nigerian counterpart Isufu Katembe before heading to Bamako. The operation was launched after a drone detected a very large motorcycle caravan in the Three Borders area. The French force sent in two Mirage jets and a drone to launch missiles, leading to what they termed the neutralization of the insurgents. According to the French military spokesperson Colonel Babri, four terrorists have been captured adding that they are working on another operation, this time targeting the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara with a total of 3,000 soldiers. Pali said the action marked a significant blow to the terrorist group which she said was linked to Al-Qaeda. The United Nations has some 13,000 troops deployed in Mali as part of its peacekeeping mission, known as MINUSMA, while France has 5,100 deployed in the Sahel region. Mali has been struggling to contain a brutal jihadist insurgency which first emerged in the north of the country in 2012, overtaking a rebellion by mostly ethnic Tuareg separatists. Former colonial power France launched a military operation to drive back the Islamists in 2013, but fighting has spread to central Mali and to neighboring Burkina Faso and Niger, leaving thousands dead and hundreds of thousands forced to flee their homes. Many analysts argue that engaging in dialogue with jihadists is one of the few escape routes from Mali's cycle of violence, and government leaders in Bamako increasingly view this option favorably. Antoine Soyanyasi for QTV News. In sports, the president of the Gambi Volleyball Federation, Baidu Rujalo, has been elected on a post as president of the Confederation of African Volleyball Zone 2 in a virtual election congress held last week. In an interview on QTV's Q Sports Show, Jalo says he's ready to take up the challenge, among the Gajaga reports. His election came after almost all the federations in Zone 2 back his candidature. Until the time of Jalo's election, Cape Verde's Antonio Rodriguez was president under whom he served as a member of the refereeing commission. Jalo, who is the first Gambian to hold this position, says he has what it takes to lead the zone. I really saw that gap and, and, and I really saw that when I come in, I can, I can add value. I can really add a lot of things in the, in the administration of the zone, of the sport in the zone. And this is why I decided to go in. But also, I think over the years, during my interaction with a lot of my colleagues, and they have really built a lot of confidence in me and most of them really even ask for me to submit my candidature and they were all ready to support my candidature. Baidu Dujalo has accumulated a wealth of experience in volleyball administration. His volleyball career began in 2003. A year later he became a referee before becoming the Gambia Volleyball Federation's treasurer and secretary general. In 2015, he became the first Gambian international FIVB referee. After serving in an acting role for two years prior, he became president of the association in 2018. Under his administration, the Gambia became continental champions in 2019 Africa Games in the beach volleyball category in Rabat, Morocco. What we have done in the Gambia has been a success story. And this model is probably what I'm going to sell in the region. Um, you know, even over the last few years, if, you, if you, you've been following us, you've seen that, you know, because of our comportment, you know, this, most of the zonal activities have been coming to Gambia. Yes. Especially the beach volleyball, almost all the Olympic qualifications for the zone have come to Gambia. Even the second round, which is beyond the zone, was hosted by Gambia. Jalo will serve for four years before another Congress is held. He says he will continue to urge governments in the zone to invest in volleyball infrastructure to improve the competitiveness of the sports on the region, continental and global stage. Zone 2 comprises the following countries, the Gambia, Senegal, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Mauritania, Sierra Leone and Cape Verde. Mamudu Gajaga, QTV News. That's our sports reporter Mamudu, Mamudu Gajaga and you can see more of that interview tonight at 9pm in our K-Sports program. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. 
Americans go to the polls in one of the most hotly contested and seemingly divisive presidential elections in its history. We have brought you an exclusive interview with American's ambassador to the Gambia, Richard Carlton Pascal. Dozens of nurses today gathered at the Ministry of Health in Banjul to voice their dissatisfaction after working for months without pay. A Gambian based in Nigeria, Lamin Barra has been appointed acting senior director of the African Development Bank's group's Nigeria country office. Residents in Piwai Tenda village in the Upper River region have raised health concerns over their only source of water. In international news, the French government on Monday said more than 50 terrorists linked to the Al Qaeda group were killed in Mali last week during an operation by French forces. In sport, the president of the Gambia Volleyball Federation, Bai Dudujalo, has been elected on a post as president of the Confederation of African Volleyball Zone 2. That's all we have for you in this edition of the QTV News. Do stay tuned for the rest of our programs. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.